Uh, so I'm going to rattle through, because these slides were designed to uh, take a bit longer than 50 minutes, so I'll whiz you through. Um, it's interesting um, hearing Michael talking about the report we did on, um, on cutting wires about uh, 10 years ago, well before my time. I've only been at NLGM for three years, but I guess one thing that strikes me is um, I don't talk a lot about technology, and I don't talk about it because uh, it's not because I'm not excited about it. I think it's immensely exciting. It's because somehow that kind of wired network world is something we always seem to be waiting for in local government. It gets lost in e-government. It gets lost in all sorts of things. And somehow it's never quite right. And I guess that's a theme of these slides. Um, you know, we are at a point where um, we have to do something very, very transformational with local governments. I have no doubt that technology, combined with a lot of very smart social things, is part of the answer. But I don't think anyone quite knows what that looks like yet. And if there's a message that comes out of this very quick raffle through the inside of my, my head that I'm going to give you, it's that we are at a stage now where we have no real choice, I think, than to lay some very big bets on what the future is going to look like. And that's quite a hard thing for local government to do. You are not institutions that like to lay big, risky bets. But if you don't, the future doesn't look very appealing. So the title of, of this presentation is Another World is Possible, Big Exclamation Mark Hurrah, but, but only maybe. And I think the word maybe is really important. I think it is possible to create a different world in the austerity future we all know is sitting three or four years out there. Um, but I think we can only make that world if we do an awful lot of work very, very quickly. So, um, what does the default position look like? What does that austerity world look like? Um, well, we ran a simulation last year. We took about 15 chief executives away to a country house. Um, and we gave them a fictional council to play with based on Swindon and said set the budget for Swindon, any borough in this case, um, out to about 2018. Tell us how you will cope with about a 40% cut in your budget. And this is what they did. This is austerity work. This is the future if we just carry on as we currently are. And it's okay, but it's not especially attractive. Um, you see capital financing dipping massively. These are all indexed. <coughs> so it shows you the variation from the original budget. Um, capital financing dips dramatically. They integrated health and social care, great, we let them have very big savings for that. But as you can see, um, in 2015-16, spend in that area goes up again, because there's so much demand coming into the system um, that no matter how fast you squeeze unit costs, your overall cost is still going to start rising. Housing got cut, central services got cut, by which they meant they made lots and lots of redundancies. They more or less got out of education entirely, outsourced all of that. And that big red line plummeting towards the ground is culture, recreation, sport, which they just didn't do anymore. They subsidised it a little bit. Uh, so, you know, that's, kind of, that's a very recognisable future, I think. When I show this to people, they all say yes. Um, we can see that that's where we might end up. But actually, we're going to do something much more innovative, much braver. We're going to break out of that. Um, but they can't tell me quite how yet. So that's where we go next. So um, this is my big question. These are a bunch of Occupy demonstrators. They are walking through um, somewhere which looks probably like Italy. Um, and they believe another world is possible, and so do I. So, what do we know about the progress you're making towards building that world? Well, actually, we know that quite a few people in local government think you can make very big savings by doing things differently. And as I'll show you in a minute, that's not entirely irrational. So if you look at this chart, this is from a survey we did of something like 70 councils, asking about attitudes to innovation. We said, how much of your savings do you think, over the next few years, could come from doing things differently as opposed to just cutting stuff back? And something like a third of them said more than 50%. Now, you know, quite a few small districts in there with that very big cut, but it's not just districts, it's counties. And if you look at the average over there, it's probably somewhere above 30%. So that's about a third of the cost pressure that people think can come um, from doing things differently. And as I say, I'll show you a chart later, which suggests that's not entirely irrational. There are some very clear priorities um, that people were giving us back in that survey. Slightly eccentric, I think, um, but it shows you what's at the top of people's minds in local government right now, certainly of chief executives, and this was primarily chiefs. Um, so health and social care right at the top, unsurprisingly. Forms of ICT and self-service, using technology to get the public to do more for themselves. Um, in second place, and more broadly, service integration beyond health and social care in third. Demand management, a slightly weird fourth. Um, that may just be because people aren't getting on top of demand management now. That's the next thing they're going to do. Um, I was really surprised at how low growth in jobs came down. Um, but that might be because people think we know what the answers are there, we just have to go and do more of it. I'm not sure I'm buying that, but maybe people do think that. Um, but there are some big barriers to innovation, and we all know what they are. The two biggest are a lack of time and a lack of skills. Um, and the skills issue, I don't think, is people beating themselves up. I think it's people saying, we are going to have to do some new things. And we don't know how to do those new things, because actually no one's really sure how to do demand management yet. 
And no one's really sure how we persuade the public to do more for themselves using um, ICT. We know bits of it, there's some stuff in the private sector, but actually we don't have those skills because they're rare and there's not much point in us having them in-house all the time. But we don't have them, we don't have much money, so where are they going to come from? I was interested in this. Um, politicians actually came very low in the mix. Politicians weren't seen as a big barrier. Um, other surveys I've seen contradict that, so maybe that's something we can discuss later. And unsurprisingly, when we ask people um, what's the current pace of innovation in the local government sector as a whole, is it too slow, too fast, about right? The vast majority of people think it's too slow. Too slow. I'll skip back to the last time. So where next? Well, this is the slide I kept referring to earlier. Uh, this is a very quick and dirty piece of work I did, where I basically just looked at all the evaluations I could find of stuff that we think can save us lots of money. And I took a fairly optimistic view, so I looked at behaviour change, I looked at health and social care integration, integrating services around families with complex needs, and shared services. And as you can see, I get to somewhere between a third and a half of the saving coming from that. Now, who knows about the quality of those figures? They're not mine, they're other people's, but... Um, but you can see how actually from doing that stuff, which is not painless, but that's extremely difficult, you can get to something like a third of the saving, which makes my chart earlier seem a bit more realistic. Um, that does leave a huge gap, of course, and you've got some tricks up your sleeve. You will reduce access to services, you'll ration more, you can commercialise some services, you can up income. Um, but still, the LGA says there's something like a 16 and a half billion gap, and I have yet to see anything that can close all of that. Part of the answer here is that I think we've been going through a phase of internally driven change. We've tried to solve our problems as local government within local government. Um, and actually we need to start looking at the world in a much more open system way. So we need to move away from efficiency, process improvement, internal service integration. Um, lots of you have done all of that. You're starting to get diminishing returns there. Into a world where we're looking much more to the outside world. So how do we get communities much more involved in helping to solve our problems? Uh, how do we work more effectively with the DCS and with other forms of uh, support we can get out there? At the moment, I think the local authorities I work with see the amount of resource they have as being defined by the council and its budget. Actually, you're there to orchestrate resource across a whole place. And if you, if you like, there's a certain quantum of need in your places. You could never meet all of it, soon you'll be able to meet less of it. But there's also a certain amount of resource, and there's more of that than you think. So how do you access that? And that's where you get into all demand management, co-production, behavioural change, early intervention. We've been using some tools recently, which I very quickly want to talk about, to try and get people to think more into that world of open source innovation, seeing the whole place, trying to work across it, and it's really hard. Um, so we've used things like scenario planning, because we think actually if we can get people to have a really strong sense of what the world is like in three or four years' time, that changes behaviour. Everything we know from disciplines like game theory tells us that if you bring the future closer, people start to behave in different ways. For instance, uh, I was doing a reading in Kent recently. It's really obvious that public services in Kent are fine for the next year or two, but in three or four years they're not sustainable unless they work together. The problem is, how do you bring that reality a lot closer to enable that collaboration? It can be done. I've done it with one or two councils. Story of planning is really a way of trying to think into the future, creating some coherent stories about what the future might look like and then working back to now to find out what you have to do to survive. So we produced some scenarios a couple of years ago for local government as a whole. Um, we created one called Recessions, which is basically where the economic crisis continues and we're all in a bit of a mess. And you can see bits of that in where we're going now. We created one called United <coughs> Provinces, where councils band together into um, what we would now call combined authorities um, and start to share services a lot more. And there was a lot of strength in that. And you can see parts of that emerging. And we created one called California, uh, where there's huge demand on your services, um, there's lots of direct democracy, um, and you have no real way to meet that demand. And I can see bits of that too. The power of this is that you then work back from these scenarios and say, right, if we need to build a set of public services that are resilient in this world, what do we do now? And actually the thing that came out most strongly from this exercise was we need to focus very much on the quality of political leadership, which is something we don't talk about enough at the moment. Um, I'm a bit of a design future geek at the moment. This is a step forward from scenario planning where you actually try and create products and service designs for the future. So this is from a company called Berg, and they were trying to imagine what the user interface of 2020 would look like. And they created this thing called Smart Light, which is basically where you use a projector to become your computer screen and interact with it on, on any kind of inert object. So you carry around a projector. In this case, you're creating basically a video screen, which you're controlling. It's not a screen at all, it's not a display. It's a projector, it's smart light. 
this is a way of prototyping the services and the goods of the future. And it's something I'm very keen to explore more through our work. As I mentioned earlier, we're doing a lot of simulations. A simulation, again, like scenario planning, is a way of making the future feel like it's a lot closer than it is. And it's also a way of getting people to play through different scenarios, to give them experiences that can help them get ready for the future. So we did the any borrow one, which I described earlier, um, which was setting the budget for Swindon to 2018. This year we did one called Newtown, which resulted in this particularly revolting crest with rainbows and butterflies. Um, Newtown was trying to do a whole place community budget and to get a bunch of people to basically take Cheshire Western Chester and turn it into a 21st century council. And we gave them lots of freedom to do that. And perhaps surprisingly, they found it really, really tough. Um, because it's relatively easy to do outcomes within services in the Reed Commission, and it's easy-ish to imagine outcomes across your whole council. But to do outcomes and to integrate across a whole place is really conceptually quite difficult. And I didn't realise how hard it was until we did the simulation. Um, and I think a lot of the people who were involved have gone away realising that actually we're not as close to that total place world as some of us thought we were. There's a lot of work to do before we can get there. And finally, we started doing a lot of hack days. Um, that's uh, an idea which is very familiar in the IT world. Lock some people up, make them come up with some apps. Um, we decided to try and do it for public services. So we did a day called One Big Idea, where we locked about 80 people um, from the public sector, um, from outside experts, people who do social innovation, we looked them up in the BT Tower and we made them come up with solutions to some of the problems that our members face today. Here they are, coming up with solutions. It's all very dynamic, that's why they've learned. Um, so, you know, and actually what we've managed to do as a result of that is inject some ideas back into councils which have been taken forward. So we have Ealing, who wanted to work out how to reduce demand for waste. And their idea is to try and install waste disposal units under sinks um, in some of their properties because that means they don't have to pick up food waste. Um, we had Nosley looking at early intervention in social care, and they're trying to work out how to create volunteer navigators for a very complex social care system, which we're taking forward with some of our private sector partners. And the one that won, because Hack Days had winners, uh, was Devon County Council, where we're effectively going to hack one of their villages. We're going to work with a village in Devon to try to redesign um, the village and the, its social infrastructure around the idea of mutual help. So how we use social enterprise, how we use the internet, social media analysis, to get that place more self-sufficient. And that really ties in with some of the ideas we're starting to play with that have come out of all this stuff we've been doing. So one which I'm really interested in, and they're not much more than ideas for now, is peer-to-peer -peer public services. It's really obvious um, that if you get people to collaborate more, as Devon are, as something like Castle Club tries to do, then we could relieve some of the pressure on the state. So how would we make peer-to-peer -peer public services a reality? I talked earlier about the idea of different kinds of conversations with the DCS and communities about accessing the assets, the capacity they have. How do we have that conversation about open service, uh, open source reform of public services? And finally, preventative tariffs. Uh, we've been really interested in the billion quid that's locked up in the NHS, but is available to local government if it can stop people getting into hospitals, if it can stop elderly people needing a hospital bed. How far could you take the preventative tariff idea? If you could create generalised preventative tariffs, local government could earn them from job centres, from DWP, but actually social enterprises could earn them too, and you could create a real market in prevention which would unlock things like social finance. A big part of the innovation story here is not just about innovating from within local government, but finding easy ways for smaller players to enter into things like the market for prevention. So we think that idea can be really powerful, and it's one we're going to explore in the new year. So in conclusion, very quickly, um, I have lots of councils who come and sit with me in my office and say, we want to do some really innovative stuff, so who do we go and copy? Um, you not think that you're fast followers. I've heard lots of people say we're fast followers, we adopt things quickly. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not. The problem with being a follower is that you need someone to follow. And in local governments at the moment, I think everyone's sort of looking at everyone else a little bit. Lots of people have got bits of the answer, there's some really good stuff happening, but where's the big strategic stuff? I don't think there are any off-the-peg answers to this which is why progress means placing some big bets. It means placing some big bets on the new stuff. And if you're going to place some big bets, but actually need to work together much more effectively to evaluate and learn from each other. Local government is an extraordinary natural laboratory. 350 organisations all dealing with the same sorts of challenge, in isolation, pretending that no one else has anything to teach them a lot of the time. It's nonsense. We have to learn from each other much more effectively. Imagine how quickly we could try stuff learn from it, iterate it, if we really shared and programmed 
uh, across local governments the way that we want it for innovation. I think we need new processes within councils to innovate, and I think we need much better ways to share, and we need them really, really fast. So, thank you. Thanks very much.